Hello everyone, we've got some more old systems to explore. This is the result of this weekend's yard sale and thrift store hunting expeditions. And we've got some pre-built systems. We've got a Gateway Performance 1000, a Dell Dimension L667R, and a Gateway Solo 5300 laptop. I also have this Microsoft Internet keyboard, looks like late 90s. And all of these systems are from the late 90s or early 2000s at the latest. So without further ado, let's tear into these. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and start with the Gateway Tower. You can see it's badged as a Pentium 3 and originally came with Windows Millennium Edition. However, something really jumped out at me about this and that's the creative CD-ROM drive. That looks to me like an early to mid 90s drive. It's kind of strange that it's in this tower. I'm very curious to see how they have that connected because I don't think that's an IDE drive. I did notice something funny. The volume knob is only partially yellowed. I am definitely going to have to get into some retro brighting. These seem to be fairly sought after drives if eBay completed listings are to be believed. So I'm definitely going to do everything I can to get it working if it doesn't work because it is the perfect CD drive for my 486 that I picked up last weekend. And hey, it even matches the patina. And having a look around the back, you can see it's an ATX system. It has most everything you need on board. It's like it's got a very basic sound card and a dial-up modem. All right, let's go ahead and crack this thing open and see what it's got inside. All right, side of the case has the Windows ME COA sticker. And this case does not have any screws. Looks like it just opens up by moving these plastic lugs. If they move, it's pretty stuck. There we go, maybe. Yes, no, there we go. Pretty obvious that no human beings have been inside this case for a good long time. Let's just go ahead and extract all the insect spider corpses. I don't know, what it is with me and spiders lately? Let's hope I only encounter deceased insects and spiders. Okay, that's clean enough for now. Looks like we have two hard drives. And that Sound Blaster CD drive is indeed an IDE drive. You can see it's an AGP system with a very curious looking uh, motherboard mounting screw there. Pretty sure that's not original. Let's go ahead and start with the peripheral cards. This case has a very strange method of retaining the peripheral cards. It's just got this thumb screw here. And then this giant piece of plastic just uh, kind of swings out and springs back on this metal plate. Here's a Broadcom dial-up modem, complete with insect carcasses. I'll go ahead and clean that up. And a very basic looking sound card, although the model number seems to suggest it's a creative sound card. Let's go ahead and scratch that sticker off and see what its chipset is. And indeed it is, possibly the most basic creative sound card I've ever seen. It's got line in, line out, and microphone. And that's all you get. All right, let's turn our attention to the RAM. And we've got 128 megabytes of PC-133. Let's just go ahead and put that back in there. Now let's have a look at the CPU. And as advertised, Intel Pentium 3 looks like maybe 1 GHz with 256 kilobytes of cache and 133 MHz front side bus. Back side looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and put that back in there. Now I'm just going to freshen up the thermal grease and put the heatsink back on. I just love how crooked that device is. Let's 
Good thing those pads are nice and big. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that creative CD drive and get a good look at it. Okay, it didn't even have power connected. Now, there we go. And there it is, the manufacture date of July 1994. This thing definitely had no business being in that case. Having a look around the back, you can see this probably isn't an IDE drive, since it's just labeled bus. This might still be of the time period where every uh, CD drive manufacturer was kind of doing their own thing and creating their own bus connections, but we'll just have to see. Let's go ahead and put this thing in a safe spot. Now let's get a look at these hard drives. Like these drive bays use these same sliding tabs. Awfully tight. We've got 160 gigabyte Western Digital Caviar. Let's take a look at the other drive. That one's really stuck. I don't want to fling it across the room. Let's give that mechanism a little workout. Give me my drive. All right, well that thing is not moving at all. It's definitely gonna require some surgery to get that out of there. Okay, well at least we can kind of see the label. I can see that it's a Western Digital Protege, 20 gigabyte drive. Let's go ahead and get that top drive back in. Now I'll go ahead and disconnect all power and give that power supply a test. Now, this being an ATX power supply, I'm going to have to uh, insert a jumper in order to get it to power on without being connected to the motherboard. And now, commence the smoke show. Okay, well, no smoke, but I also don't have the fan turning. Let's see if that's stuck. Nope, that's dead. Check my jumper. Jumper is jumped believe that power supply is dead. Either that or just the fan is dead, which is probably just as bad. No, we definitely got voltage problems. That power supply is quite dead. You can see when I insert the jumper, it jumps up to about four volts and then just bleeds off. That's a sign of capacitor problems. And same deal on the five volt rail, but no big deal. It's just a regular old ATX power supply. All right, got a spare ATX power supply. Let's see what happens. And it turns on. It's complaining. Go ahead and plug the monitor and see what it's complaining about. Wow, this thing is serious about its mouse connection. Well, let's go ahead and plug in a keyboard and mouse and see how far we get. All right, got the keyboard and mouse connected. Power on. Still complaining. And no surprise, the CMOS battery's dead. Let's run setup. Pretty basic. Okay, anything I do in here is gonna be useless, so let's go ahead and throw a fresh CMOS battery in there. And it just takes a regular old CR2032. All right, fresh CMOS battery is in. Also reconnected all the drives, why not? Power on. Hard drives sound healthy. Gotta go through setup. Check our boot configuration. Okay, not much there. Let's check our boot order. 
good enough. Save and reboot. Still got complaints. It really wants me to set that time. You would think it would have loaded some defaults or something. Okay, I'll humor you. Let's go ahead and do February 1990. Oh, you know what? That might confuse the operating system. Let's go to 2000. Now will you boot? Okay, apparently that CD drive is not functional. I did not put the creative drive back in. Oh well, whatever. Continue without. Okay, got a floppy drive seek. No operating system found. That's really not liking those hard drives. I think this board might have issues. Well, let's try a DOS boot disk. Well, that was fast. It didn't even try. Okay. Now stuff's happening. Alright, let's see. Do we have C drive? No, we do not. Okay, maybe this machine does not auto-detect IDE. Let's reboot back in the setup. Let's see, IDE configuration. It does detect both hard drives. It does not detect that CD drive. Some very strange things going on. Okay, it's got data for the primary hard drive. The second one's perfectly fine. Let's just make the floppy the first boot device. Let's see, IDE drive configuration, pretty normal. All right, well, let's try now. Still complaining about the CD drive, and still no love from the hard drives. They're definitely spun up, and they're initialized. So let's drop down to a single IDE device, see what happens. All right, I've got only the primary master connected, so let's see. Still with the complaints about CD drives. It does not want to boot. Well, I think this system might be a victim of a failed power supply. And I sure hope that creative CD-ROM drive wasn't connected while that happened. Okay, yeah, that CD drive is just completely dead to the world. No signs of life whatsoever. The LED doesn't even blink. Which begs the question, did my creative CD-ROM drive survive? Let's see. Okay, that's encouraging. That's at least more than the other drive is doing. Let's see if it opens. And it opens. Well, it might just be a stroke of luck that this thing was disconnected from the power supply, assuming that's what killed the other drive. Yeah, look at that, it's not even stuck. My precious. Okay, I connected my IDE to USB adapter to the primary master and connected it to my bench PC and is detected and mounts up in Linux just fine. And this thing has tons of PII on it. Look at this, this thing has tax documents on it. People, I'm begging you, stop discarding your computers with sensitive info on it. Okay, well, let's see if the secondary drive mounts. Okay, no problems with that drive either. Let's just see if there's any strangeness with the uh, disk layout. Oddly enough, this one is configured as the boot drive. I don't think the other one had a boot sector. Maybe that's what this whole thing's deal is. Okay, yeah, no boot sector on what was the primary master. So let's go ahead and try booting it up with just the secondary drive. All right, power on. Still complaining about CD. Okay, that's different. It's in uh, backup utility or system restore. Is your PC clock correct? Sure. Let's not do that. Oh, there it goes, it's booting. Okay, there's an account on there. Let's see if there's a password. Oh, well, somebody's secure. 
What was that error sound? Did you hear that? <laughs> it just makes wind noise. That's funny. Okay, well this being Win9x, we don't need passwords. Let's hit the escape key. Alright, confused about the monitor. Sure. At last, we have Windows ME. Wow, this thing's got AOL on it. Gotta open that up. Wow, I haven't seen this in so long. Update your modem settings. I don't have a modem. Can I maybe go away? Nope. Let's not. Okay, maybe I should have plugged the modem back in. I just want to look at AOL. Wow, still got a password on it. Let's see. And lots of favorites. This is surreal. I haven't seen this interface in decades. Let's see. Show me the, oh, there it is, the email dialogue. Well, kids, this is how we used to send email. Okay, well, that's enough AOL. What is this? Oh, that is weird. They have documents pinned to the side of the screen there. Very strange. Okay, well, let's see our 20 gig drive. Got plenty of free space. Nor an antivirus. And that is awfully quiet for a 20 gigabyte drive. I would have hoped it would have been noisier. I do like me a crunchy sounding hard drive. Okay, this thing is slam full of PII, so I better not go any further. Let's see what kind of applications they have on here. Looks like it's got the office suite. Let's see how long it takes Excel to open. Hey, this thing's pretty quick. Oh my god, Clippy! I found a perfectly preserved Clippy! Just doesn't get any better than that. Alright, well let's close out of this. Okay, well, other than that CD-ROM drive being dead, everything else in the system seems to work fine. And it's actually really snappy, which is absolutely amazing for Windows ME, even with Norton on it. Oh no, virus protection is disabled. Whatever will I do? What is that? Is that Norton Ghost? <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, that was fun. Let's shut this thing down. Thing has the weirdest set of sounds. Okay, well, apart from a dead power supply and CD drive, this thing is perfectly fine. I'm definitely gonna have to scrub all of that personal data because I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, well, partial success. Let's go ahead and close this thing up and move on to the next system. All right, staying with the gateways, let's check out this laptop. You can see according to the yard sale sticker, it allegedly works. It has Windows ME with a Pentium 3 and 64 megs of RAM. I didn't actually end up paying this much though. The yard sale lady was so sweet that she gave it to me for 20 bucks because she saw how excited I was about it. Now I didn't actually test it myself, but I got it for so cheap it doesn't matter if it works or not. And so far the only problems I see are these stress cracks at the hinges. If you lift up the lid, you can see how just from the flexing of the opening and closing it has broken that plastic. But that shouldn't be a big deal. I should be able to get this apart and reinforce the backside of this with fiberglass. And since I've amassed uh, quite a collection of old laptops that need repair, I'm going to be doing a series of repair-a-thon videos, so I'll definitely be including these repairs in that. And taking a look at the back, we've got the power connector and USB, and we've got our VGA output, serial port, and the docking station port, and interestingly enough, has composite video output. And then we just got our standard parallel port and a keyboard slash mouse PS2 port. Taking a look at the side, you can see it has a floppy drive. It's very nice. 
I definitely prefer this to have a floppy drive over a CD drive, especially since it has USB. And not a whole lot going on on the front, so you have our power and battery LEDs. And on the right side, we've got our audio jacks, a dial-up modem, two PC card slots. And it looks like it had an option for a uh, onboard LAN card. I'm guessing since that's plugged that it doesn't have that. But you know what? Someone's been digging at that, so I want to make sure that it actually does not have onboard Ethernet. Oh, it does. Yeah, it's definitely in there. I wonder why they had it plugged. Okay, well, I'm just going to leave that plug out for now so we can test that. See if this thing can get online. And not a whole lot going on in the back. Got our Windows ME COA sticker. I do want to pull this battery out. It looks like uh, got some damage. And there's very little chance of it actually working anyway, so let's go ahead and try to get that out. Okay, well, it's not coming out with hand pressure alone. Feels like it might be swollen or something. Looks like something might have leaked or, or just got up in there. But it is a lithium cell. Let's see if that test button does anything. It does nothing. You know what? Let's see if it charges. All right, let's have a peek under some of these covers. I'm guessing this is probably the RAM expansion. And indeed it is. Got our PC100 SODIMM module. Let's pull that out of there. That thing is really stuck in there. We got a little something on the edge connector there. I'm going to clean that off. All right, let's get that back in. Now I have no clue what could be behind this cover. So let's see. Okay, some kind of expansion card. Could this thing possibly have Wi-Fi? Well, it's definitely not a Wi-Fi card. The two wires here seem to suggest that it's a dial-up modem, which probably means that onboard NIC doesn't work because that's probably what this connects to. Okay, let's go ahead and put that back in there. Now let's take a look at that hard drive. It's a 10GB IBM Travel Star. If these are anything like the Desk Star drives, also known as the Death Star drives, they're not known for their reliability. So hopefully this works. It's got a manufacture date of December 2000. Let's just get that back in there. All right, quick test of the power supply shows everything's in order. So let's go ahead and turn this thing on. Now we've got the Pentium 3 badge and what must have been at one time the Windows ME badge. All right, well, let's see what it does. The hard drive initialized. But we've got no display. Let's see if maybe there's a bad connection. No, no bad connection. Doesn't sound like it's doing much. Well, let's try again. I'm a little suspicious that we don't have any uh, LED activity up here. Yeah, even caps lock doesn't do anything. All right, well, we've got some investigating to do. All right, trying the simplest thing first. I went ahead and cleaned up the rest of the edge connector on that RAM stick. So let's see what it does. Oh, look at that, got a picture. Oh, it's complaining. But we can see it's a 650 megahertz Pentium 3. Does indeed have 64 megs of RAM. Previous boot incomplete. Okay, carry on. Hey, it's booting. It does indeed have Windows ME on it. 
Sounds like that floppy drive might work. All right, definitely had an improper shutdown at some point. Let's just see what ScanDisk says. Hard drive definitely sounds healthy. This could take a while. Okay, this is taking an incredibly long time. I think we'll do this later. And got a desktop. Oh, is that that active desktop thing? Indeed it is. Oh no, my McAfee expired. Whatever will I do? All right, well, things seem perfectly healthy. Okay, the battery allegedly has 83%. I definitely don't believe that. All right, let's see. What's going on with C? It's like a 10 gigabyte drive. Plenty of free space. All right, let's see if the floppy drive works. And indeed it does. Seems perfectly healthy. All right, let's get some system info. The network adapters. Well, it appears that onboard LAN card probably is not active. Let's see what this thing's got on here. Oh, hooray! More PII. Not much in the way of programs. It does have Office on here. Oh, maybe not. Alright, so it was a trick. All right, well, let's connect the network card anyway and see what happens. And yeah, that nick is not active. There's not even a link light on my switch. Oh well. Okay, well, not much else on this thing except for even more personal information. But yeah, this thing's working. One final thing to test, though. Let's see how badly that battery indicator is lying. And it is completely full of lies. That battery has no life left whatsoever. And yeah, I know, I know, improper shutdown on a FAT32 file system. I'm gonna have to scrub this drive clean anyway, because of all that personal data. All right, well, let's move on to the Dell. Dude, you're getting a Dell. That's right, I just reminded you of that. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, consider yourself lucky. This is a Dell Dimension L667R. You can see this machine is also a Pentium 3, and it's badged for multiple versions of Windows. Got Windows 2000, Windows NT4, and Windows 98. So this was definitely a business-oriented machine. So you've got a 52-speed CD-ROM drive, it's also a CDRW drive, and a DVD-ROM. I can't imagine that's a SATA drive, so that'd be really useful to have an IDE DVD-ROM drive around. And having a look around the back, we can see it basically has all the same I.O. options as the gateway tower, with the addition of a LAN card. In fact, I just gotta compare the two because it's kind of uncanny. I wonder if those motherboards are somehow related. And on the side, we've got COA stickers for Windows 98 and Windows ME. Honestly, this case is in really good condition. It's very little yellowing. Okay, so now I gotta figure out how to open this thing. I don't see any screws on the back. All I see is this here, which looks like it slides or something. Yeah, that pulls out. Oh, ain't getting far. No, ah, there we go. Okay, so this entire half of the machine folds down. And we got a date stamp on that power supply, July 17th, 2000. And it does have a hard drive, although it's in a very strange place. So I've worked with Dells before in an enterprise environment, back in my sysadmin days. And one of the things that we're really good about is they're really easy to take apart without using any tools. And it looks like that idea extends all the way back to this machine. So you can see what it looks like we can just pull this tab down, hopefully it doesn't break. And then swing the power supply out of the way. Well, Get that cable unhooked first. There we go. And that kind of puts it in a service position. But let's go ahead and disconnect that power supply because it has to be tested.
And I can see that DVD drive is indeed an IDE drive. That's pretty handy to have. And oh yeah, this thing is all business. It doesn't even have an AGP port. And this board has the Intel 810 Northbridge, almost the same as the Gateway. The Gateway has an 815. Well, let's take a look at that sound card. And this card is also one of those baby creative sound cards. And it is filthy. Let's take a look at the network card. Standard issue Realtek with embossed IO shield. Fancy. And that must be the MAC address. And let's take a look at the dial up modem, why not? Connexant or Connexant. I could never figure out how to pronounce that brand. Pretty dirty as well. No clues as to the speed, but I'm assuming it's 56K, with this being the year 2000 and all. Man, that CPU cooler is dusty. It makes me want to sneeze just looking at it. Well, let's go ahead and pull it off. And as advertised, Intel Pentium 3, a bit slower than the gateway. Looks like 667 megahertz. That thermal pad has definitely seen better days. So let's go ahead and get that off. Okay, that's going to take some scrubbing, so I better pull it out of there. It's got some IPA. There we go, much better. All right, had to move to the great outdoors for this step. Well, that fan bearing is definitely good. Let's likewise clean up the heatsink. Alright, heatsink's back on with a fresh thermal pad. Also did just a quick de-dusting of the motherboard with an anti-static brush. You don't want to use compressed air or a vacuum cleaner on a motherboard because of the potential for static damage. Alright, let's go ahead and test that power supply. Okay, well despite the appearance of this connector, this is not actually a standard ATX power supply connector. This is some kind of weird proprietary thing that Dell came up with. And I searched for about 30 minutes to find a pinout with no success whatsoever. So, I'm going to have to test this power supply the risky way. I'm going to have to have it connected to the motherboard. Now I've got two meters monitoring the 12 and 5 volt rails, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw the switch. Okay, looks good. And the motherboard is on. And sounds like it posted. So let's go ahead and get the monitor connected and see what it's doing. Alright, monitor is connected. Power on. And it got activity. So I got 384 megabytes of RAM. Disk drive works, or it sounds like it works. And detects both drives. And it looks like it's got some kind of flavor of Windows NT on it. Ooh, that's not good. Inaccessible boot device. Well, that's odd. I didn't change around any uh, IDE channels or anything. But there could be a number of things that it's angry about. Let's just go ahead and reboot and uh, check the CMOS settings. All right, IDE configuration. Yeah, everything's in the right spot. Let's double check the boot order. Looks fine. Okay, well, I guess that install of Windows is just corrupted. Okay, well, I guess we'll try a DOS boot disk. Hey, the floppy drive works. Alright, and the CD drive is detected. Now, obviously, this being DOS, it's not going to have any uh, support for NTFS, but let's see. Yeah, no C drive. Okay, well, let's try something else. All right, let's see if we can boot this thing up into Nopix. And if you're unfamiliar with Nopix, it is a live bootable Linux distribution.
based on Debian. It's loaded with just about every tool you could ever want for a system recovery and doing various things. And in my experience has excellent hardware support. I've been using Nopix for about 20 years now and it is magic. And this is the latest version of Nopix, so we're gonna see if modern Linux can run on this 23 year old computer. Well, let's just see if the CD-ROM opens. No, it does not. Okay, we're gonna have to give it some help. There we go. Sounds like the CD drive's working. And indeed it is. Got an Opix splash screen. Let's go ahead and boot. And hey, Nopix is booting. Be very interested to see if the graphical environment works. And look at that. Got into the graphical environment. And actually, it didn't take all that long. It's going about as fast as Nopix usually does from CD. Okay, well, we're booted up. It's definitely got a weird resolution, so let's see and fix that. Well, that is a giant terminal. Let's see what resolution options we have. Well, maximum 640 by 480. But I'm just amazed that Nopix booted at all with a fairly recent Linux kernel. Okay, well, this GUI is going to be kind of clunky when 640 by 480, but fortunately, this is Linux. We don't need a GUI break out to a terminal. And there we go. All right, let's just see what device node that hard drive got assigned. Looks like it got assigned SDA. And most likely Nopix created an FS tab entry for it. So let's see. And indeed it did. So we should just be able to mount. So just SDA one. And it mounted. Let's see. And definitely got a Windows install. It's like either NT4 or Windows 2000. We can confirm by looking in the boot.ini. And it is indeed Windows 2000 Professional. I wonder why it won't boot. This hard drive does not sound unhealthy. Well, let's see if there's any user data on it. And indeed there is. Tisk tisk. Okay, well, since we're on Linux, we can do a quick test of the hard drive, or at least its uh, ability to read. All I gotta do for that is just run the dd command, set the input device as the entire block device for the hard drive, and set the output device to devnull, and give us a nice um, progress indicator. So that output device of devnull it's kind of like a black hole for data. You can write as much data as you want into it and it just goes nowhere. It's a really convenient option for doing stuff like this. So DD is going to read the entire hard drive and see if we get any I.O. errors. All right, DD was able to read the entire hard drive with no I.O. errors. It took 1113 seconds. Well, let's just confirm. Let's look at the uh, kernel output. Okay, weirdly enough, we have I.O. errors on the CD drive, but we don't have any on the hard drive, so I'd say the hard drive is perfectly healthy, at least for read operations. Okay, well, let's go ahead and shut this thing down. Okay, well, aside from the goofy power supply and the CD drive being a little stuck, this machine is perfectly healthy. Now, I could get a Windows 2000 CD and try to recover the boot sector, but since this drive already contains somebody's personal information, I'm just going to go ahead and wipe it, and I'll probably do a clean install of Windows 2000. Or maybe I'll just put Linux on this machine, since it seems to run perfectly fine. So let's go ahead and pull that hard drive out of there. These little pull tabs on these IDE cables are awfully handy. Okay, now I gotta figure out how to get that thing out of there. I do not see any screws. Alright, this machine just gets weirder and weirder. Looks like in order to get the hard drive out, I've gotta actually bend this metal tab over. And then... Pull it out. Maybe. There we go. Wow, that is weird. The hard drive just sits in there. No screws or anything, it just has these little metal tangs that go into the screw holes. Okay, well now that the hard drive is out, we can get a good look at it. It is a Western Digital Caviar, 13GB IDE drive. 
Now let's go ahead and set this hard drive aside because I'm going to wipe it. Okay, now I want to get these hard drives wiped, especially this drive from the gateway that's loaded with somebody's tax documents. So I'm just going to connect it back up to my bench PC, and I'll show you my method for wiping drives. Alright, let's go ahead and turn on the IDE to USB device. And the hard drive is initialized, so let's see if it got assigned a block device. Got assigned SDB, so in order to wipe drives I just use regular old Linux. You could use something like DBAN, but the method I use is perfectly acceptable, and nearly every Linux distribution in existence already comes with the tools needed to do it. So let's just write a simple bash script. Alright, we'll just set bash as the interpreter. Set up an infinite while loop. And we'll just set up a little counter to keep track of how many times it's run. And to do the actual wipe, we'll just use the dd command again. And we'll take input from the slash dev slash u random device node. The u random device node gives you direct access to the random number generator. It basically just outputs a bunch of random garbage data. And we'll write that garbage directly to our hard drive. And device node sdb. Now if you use this method to wipe drives, you need to make triple sure that that is the actual device node for the drive you want to wipe, because DD will ask no questions. It'll just run and destroy. And let's give us a little status indicator. And then we'll just print out to the screen how many times it's run. And then we'll close the while loop. And that's it. Write and quit. Now I'll give our script executable permissions. And then, go ahead and run it. And I usually just let this run for a day or so. And you can see it's running at a painfully slow 10 megabytes a second. But that's just due to the fact that it's going through the uh, USB adapter, plus it's an old IDE drive. But, I don't really care. As long as it makes 5 passes, I'm perfectly happy with it. Alright, today is tomorrow, and we see that our script is looped five times, and that's good enough for me. Fortunately, I don't see any I.O. errors, which is good news for the health of this hard drive, so let's go ahead and stop it. And the last item I want to show is this Microsoft Internet Keyboard. This is from somewhere around the late 1990s, as indicated by the Win9x icons on the Windows keys. It's always nice to have Microsoft peripherals from the 90s. There's no significant wear on the keycaps, and for being a membrane keyboard, it actually has a pretty nice sound. It's no Model M, but certainly sounds pretty nice in my opinion. And the only thing that's missing is the removable palm rest. But that's perfectly fine. It's totally usable the way it is. And taking a look at the back, it's got this giant health warning. And has all of its original rubber feet. As well as the uh, keyboard standoffs. And taking a look at the label, it's got the nice holographic Microsoft sticker on it. Model RT9410. And I've already tested this keyboard, it works perfectly fine, so the only thing left to do is to clean it up. Alright, got all the screws removed, so I should be able to lift this off, and all the keys come with it. And the inside of this thing is actually really clean. Now in order to give this thing a full and proper cleaning, I'm going to go ahead and remove all of these keycaps. And these keycaps are super easy to remove, just take a pair of tweezers or something and squeeze these tabs together, and then just push it through. Now I can see what horrors lie beneath. Gross. Okay, the spacebar has a tiny spring behind it. it looks like it's supposed to have two, because there's two uh, spring bosses there. But I can only find one. And I checked back on the video, and there was definitely only one in there. So I guess I'll search through my junk collection and see if I can find a spring that's appropriate. If not, the spacebar felt perfectly fine with only one spring. Went ahead and removed all the metal support bars from the keys that have them. And nothing high tech here. Just some Dawn dish soap and warm water in a holiday Tupperware container that I definitely didn't forget to return to my mom's house. Just gonna give that some agitation. 
and then I'm just gonna let them soak for a while. And don't worry, Mom, I'll buy you some new Tupperware. And similarly, Yeah, that's better. Now I noticed these support bars had a little bit of grease on them, on both the hinge and the part that slides on the keyboard. And I'll also put it on the part that contacts the keyboard. Alright, got it back together. I do still have only one spring under the space bar, but it is plenty springy enough between that one spring and the membrane, so it's perfectly fine. I just want to give a huge thanks to everyone who's subscribed and pledged their support on Patreon. I am absolutely blown away by the recent growth of this channel. I sincerely appreciate all of you. And if you're new to the channel, I'm doing stuff like this all the time, so be sure to subscribe. I'm going to do my best to release a video as often as possible, as long as I can continue finding systems like these. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.